Who knows indeed what happens after death? At Kashi, all you see is that the measure of your life is the weight of wood it takes to burn your body. But Hindus believe that death is not the end, that we're reborn into another life, that there is a unity of all creation to which eventually we may return. Looking at it through Western eyes, it's easy to think that this is a society trapped in the past, that here religion really is the opium of the people, a people confounded by the stresses of the modern world, finding comfort in dreams. But after a while, another thought begins to nag. Perhaps it is we in the West who have lost touch with things deep inside us, things still necessary to make us whole. We who see death as the opposite of life, where in India, death is the opposite of birth. The cremations continue on the banks of the river all day and all night. The body is reduced to a handful of ash and the spirit is freed once more. For the crowds on the Banaras waterfront, these scenes are everyday life, for they have come for Darshan to see the sacred river itself and to be purified by its water. For water is India's life, and the Ganges is the water of India. It is all India's rivers. Around it are entwined her deepest memories, her hopes and fears, her joys and her sorrows. It's hard to look on such scenes, especially for us on the outside. Our feelings of guilt make us turn away. It's a short rickshaw ride away from the river to get back to the warmth and safety of the town. There the crowds are gathering, for tonight is Shivratri, the great Hindu festival celebrating Shiva's marriage. It's Banaras' biggest night of the year, and on Shivratri, everything is unpredictable. So what happens on Shivratri? Coming many Kalakar, Mridang player, and everybody making puja of Lord Shiva, and playing some Damburu sound. Now, I didn't quite catch all that. But does it matter? After all, is not this visible world of parking fines and rickshaw repayments mere Maya illusion? You come to Shivratri. Coming for Shivratri, and I'll meet you and you up aye, Tulsi Ghat aye. Yeah. Or Dhaa Gardhan, Moha Bajaye, Ko Jamke, Bhanga Gola Chhanke. Some South Indian, yeah. On festival days, Banaras shows its other side. It's a busy and expensive commercial city where the spiritual and the material go hand in hand. It's a warren of alleys full of guides, shopkeepers, landladies and con men on the lookout for wide-eyed pilgrims and tourists. And all this commerce is watched over by the patron saint of businessmen and shopkeepers, the elephant-headed Ganesh, who removes obstacles and keeps the world turning. It's almost impossible to be on your own in India. But right at the top of Banaras is a 17th century observatory built by a Maharaja like most of the great buildings along the waterfront. No one seems to come here anymore. From here you can either gaze at the heavens or look out at the opposite bank. If you die over there, the man on the rickshaw told me, you'll come back in the next life as a donkey. Funny sense of humour, God. Here at Banaras, as the sun set on the night of Shivratri, the festival of the great god Shiva, the bathers still crowded the banks, absorbed in all their different duties. Alone among them, I felt a little out of place with my doubts and my certainties. For these are people who know so clearly why they're here, bathing, doing their pujas, their worship, or simply lost in thought. The night of Shivratri, the February new moon, marks the end of winter, the coming of spring, and the beginning of the hot season. And as the crowds gathered in the heart of the labyrinth, I came face to face with the riddle of modern Indian history. Hindu, Muslim, how will these pasts best serve the future? And behind it all, filling the night, is still the presence of Shiva. In the heart of the alleys is an Islamic mosque built in the 17th century on the ruins of the old Hindu temple of Shiva, Lord of the Universe. 
All day long, the Hindu pilgrims have filed round the mosque to reach their temple, destroyed again and again by fanatical Muslim emperors, while the Indian army stands on guard against the threat of violence between Hindu and Muslim. Tonight, the pilgrims had come in their tens of thousands for Darshan to see, and I was swept along with them. It's easy to see why first impressions of India can so often repel or overwhelm. There are so many meanings, so hard to hold on to, revealing themselves only gradually. It is frightening and yet somehow familiar, disturbing yet deeply desirable, lost to us but still dimly comprehended. And all the while, Mingling with the smoke of firecrackers, the smell of petrol and incense, the past seems to hang in the night, electric in the mouth. You're supposed to stay up all night on Shivratri to ward off evil spirits, but it was all too much for me. Before I fell asleep, crossing to the other shore, I remembered a story. The Hindu scriptures say that Banaras is the place where creation starts each time the world is born again. They say that before creation, there was an ocean of unborn matter with neither time nor space, nor light nor dark, nor death nor immortality. Then an egg of life was conceived in the waters, and from that egg came everything. Hindus say our reality is Maya, illusion. Even the great gods are all part of a universal consciousness, call it what you will, from which we are all made and to which all things return. An endless, unceasing flow of energy which comes from joy, is sustained by joy, and to joy returns. Since the creation, Hindus say, there have been times when all life had a balance and a wholeness when the oxen drew the plough and the cows gave milk, when there was plenty and the law of life, dharma, was pure. This vision of a golden age of pastoral India, many Indians still hold in their hearts today. And it is true that it is from the villages that India's creative power has come, rooted in the rich life of the soil. But in the countryside today, the story is one of change, brought by the modern world. The railways have helped create modern India, giving it a unity and a mobility it never had before. But trains go on western tracks in western time and slowly have eroded older lines of communication. I was on my way from Banaras to Calcutta, 300 miles down the Ganges plain, when I broke my journey at Balpur. Out here in the countryside, people's lives are still ruled more by the elements, by the gods of nature, than by Delhi. Scorched in summer, liable to flood every monsoon, the very things which bring life, the sun and the river Ganges, also bring destruction. Despite that, most Indians, over 600 million, still live in villages. Though a village like Jai Dev is India's roots. Over the last 40 years, the road in and out of the village has brought in many new influences from the outside, and even new gods, 